we are saved by grace. And uh, God done the work for us. God is the one who did everything necessary for us to be qualified for heaven. And we don't add to that. But having said that, I think that we have to realize that uh, we are not exempt from responsibility in the Christian life. That God has called us all to, to be what he'd have us to be and to do what he'd have us to do. Sometimes um, we are people who want to uh, see certain things happen. And we expect things to turn out a certain way. And when they don't, we can lose heart. We can become disillusioned and even sometimes bitter and angry. And so I think this is a parable about persistence. And it's so much more. But... In this parable, we, we want to be careful that we don't uh, read too much into it because sometimes we have a tendency to, um, to read too much into things and, and miss the point. There's usually a point, and sometimes more than one, but at least one main point. And, uh, and so we want to look at that today. And this parable is about this lady who comes to a judge who is an unjust judge, by the way. And so we must be careful not to say, well, this guy, this judge represents God because he's really, God is nothing like this person. He's very unjust. He doesn't care about people and he doesn't care about the law. He's not willing, you know, to take care of her situation because it's the right thing to do, which, you know, which should be the thing. He's not willing to do it because the law Maybe uh, he understands the fine points of the law. In fact, he ignores her. Now, this lady who comes to him is a widow. And we understand that in the Bible days, uh, and even somewhat today, but especially then, widows were very vulnerable people. They were often preyed upon by society and taken advantage of. They were uh, so vulnerable that many people could, uh, could hurt them and take advantage of them without any repercussions. You know, it's sad to look at some of the history of this, and, and we, we've seen it many times. But here's a lady who, who comes to this judge and wants him to do something about her situation. Maybe someone has, has uh, taken advantage of her. Maybe someone has uh, taken what she had, uh, done something terrible to her, and she has at least a legal problem here that by law she has a right to be defended and taken care of. But instead of that, the judge just ignores her cries. So she continues to knock, and she continues to knock, and she continues to aggravate him. She leaves him messages on his phone and texts him and, and sends him letters in the mail, and she continues to aggravate him till finally he says, I, I, I don't care anything about this person or what she's talking about, but she's aggravating me to death. So I'm going to do this for her. And so I think today, if nothing else, that we can take away from this sermon, if you just get one thing, is that, is that we keep knocking. And that we don't give up. Now, again, looking at this passage, there's a lot to unpack here. But basically you have a, a, a parable about, he starts off talking about prayer, Jesus said. But then he goes into talking about uh, justice. A woman wanting justice, and so that's involved, and we live in a world today where a lot of people are uh, taken advantage of, and evil, evil things happen in this world, and we think about all the, the things that go on, uh, not just in our country, but in other places, with people that uh, are in other countries that are being taken advantage of, and by the uh, ISIS people who, who go into these cities 
and we think about the, the young ladies that they've taken and they've, they've sold them into uh, sex trafficking and uh, just all these terrible things that are done that people do today. And here's a woman who wants justice. And I think sometimes that we live in a world where we also may cry out, how long, O oh Lord? How long before you intervene? And how long is this going to go on? And how long do I have to suffer? And how long? And maybe you've prayed and you've asked God and, and it hasn't you know, been the way you want it to be. But I want you to know that God says to you, I hear you. And I'm not like that unjust judge, but the problem is sometimes that we don't know the mind of God and we don't know God's timetable, but God is going to set all things right and he's going to make all things right eventually. And Jesus says that when he comes, shall he find faith on the earth. And so it's also a parable about keeping faith in the midst of trying to get an answer of whatever it is you're trying to get. And sometimes, yes, it feels like God is a million miles away, and it feels like that our prayers aren't going higher than the ceiling, and it just, we feel like, what's the point and why do we keep going? And yet we're reminded to keep knocking. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you fi shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. But there's those times when I've asked and I've seeked and I've knocked. And I haven't gotten what I thought I should have gotten. And I feel sometimes discouraged. And I ask God, how long, O Lord? There's this also an eschatological uh, aspect to this parable in, in, in the sense that Jesus is talking about coming back someday. And he's talking about the future, the end times. And that he says, when he returns, and he says he will de deliver Justice speedily. And so there's a sense here that we have to understand that it may not happen exactly when we want it to or think it should, but God is going to come back someday, and he is going to set all things straight. And so we look for that, and we understand that there's, come, there's a day of reckoning. There is a day of reckoning when all these things are going to happen, and we have to just trust God in that. And so... Our part, Jesus says, is not to lose heart, to keep, keep on keeping on, to keep praying, and just leave it the rest up to God. There are those people who, who will say to me, you know, I, I just feel, uh, I feel like I'm far away from God. And I feel like God isn't answering my prayers. And I... I, I my marriage is suffering, or, or this is suffering in my life, and, and all these things. And then I ask them, what are you doing about it? Where's your part in this relationship? Well, I ain't been to church in a while. In fact, I, I've been missing a whole lot. I haven't been praying much. Have, we haven't been doing our devotions much. And so it's no wonder that we feel away from God. It's no wonder that we feel uh, that, that God is a million miles away because we, and by the way, you, you know the old saying that, that if God has seemed like he's not close to you anymore, guess who moved? I give, let me give you this parable. A man and a woman get married. And, uh, they, you know, they go off on their honeymoon and all that. Then they come back, and the man leaves, and he goes on a trip. And she expects him back for a couple days, and he doesn't come back. Days turn into months, and months turns into years. Finally, one day, the man shows up after years, comes in the house, and walks in like nothing's changed, only to find out that she has moved on. She's had the marriage annulled. By this time, she's remarried. And he's like, what happened to our vows? Like, you know, what happened to the fact that, you know, you love me and you said you'd never, uh, this would never change? What happened? 
Well, that's exactly what we do to God sometimes. We, we, we treat God like he is, uh, you know, someone that we don't have anything to do with. And then we wonder why we feel distant from God. You see, in the church, we have these things that we call traditions. And I know some people don't like tradition, but we uh, Methodists are very methodical about those things. But we do that on purpose because we understand that we need certain things in our life that are traditional. We need those uh, disciplines in our life to remind us every Sunday and every time we come to church what we're here for and what it's all about. And that's why we read scriptures and we have litanies and we do these things as a, a tradition. Because it's something that's been ingrained in us. And every time we do it, when we do communion and we do these litanies and we read the responsive readings and the scriptural readings and all this and all these things that people say, why do we do that? It's because the word of God is being ingrained in us and we are making it a part. It's important that we do these traditions and that we keep on keeping on, keep on keeping on. You see, the prayer is more than just a one time getting on our knees. Prayer is a life. It's an attitude. It's everything that we do and we say to God is our prayer. Our life is a prayer, really. And so our relationship with God is involved in here. And I think God is saying to us that we need to keep, keep, keep on keeping on. It's all part of the Christian life. And uh, this morning I asked Mark to pray for me. Uh, just feeling a little discombobulated this morning with all that's going on. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I don't want to preach a message on prayer without prayer, really. But how important prayer is in our life. I think sometimes we live in a world of such instant gratification that we expect a Christian life to be that way. You know, and we can get... Uh, oatmeal in a minute, we can get boiled eggs in three minutes, we can get uh, all these things in just instantly. We can drive through, we expect to get our food right then. And when it comes to the Christian life, we want that same thing to happen. And we expect that we're going we're gonna to read something or we're going to go to church and all of a sudden it's all there, but it doesn't work that way. It takes years and years of tradition and discipline to mature and to grow in the Christian that God wants us to be. It's something that we keep working at and we keep doing. It doesn't happen overnight. And so we continue to read scriptures and we continue to do these things and we sing songs and we do these things because it's part of what helps us grow. It's kind of like having a friend, you know. Uh, friendship is something that develops over time. You don't, uh, you don't become really close friends just uh, overnight, usually. And I know we, today we, we use that term loosely. We have uh, 599,000 friends on Facebook. And we don't know half of them. And they would, most of them would, would not come in the middle of the night to get us out of jail if we were in jail, right? So that's not a friend. Hopefully that don't happen, but anyway, you know, and, and we call them friends. But, you know, Jesus, when he used that word friend, he used a term there with the disciples. He said, you know, they, they were, in a sense, willing to be his slaves. Doulos in the Greek, slave, and I am bound to you, and you're my master. And that's the kind of relationship that, that you have with God, the master-servant-slave relationship, where you bow down to him. But Jesus said, from henceforth, I'm not going to call you slave. I'm going to call you friend. Friend. Jesus, the master of the universe, decided to call me his friend. Which means that it, it's a totally different dynamic here. And so it's not just I'm doing all this because I'm his slave, although I want to be. And I'm not doing this because I have to, but out of a heart of love and a heart of expressing my desire and gratitude to God for what he's done for me, I can call him friend. What a relationship. 
what a dynamic that we have with God that you, we, you know, we get this picture of God as some mean judge up there in the sky and then we begin to see that he wants to be our friend. Man. And so being a friend to someone takes time, takes effort. Sometimes there's long hours of communication, prayer. There are times where you get a call in the middle of the night and you go to them. Or you hear uh, your friend uh, has lost someone in their life and you get in your car and you drive miles. When my father passed away from a car wreck, I was pastoring a church in West Virginia, Beckley, West Virginia, and my father in Paintsville. And I drove to Paintsville and the piano player and her husband drove all the way from Beckley, West Virginia to Paintsville to be at the funeral. And she even played the piano. See, that's a friend. Right now, I could call them, and I could say, I need a place to stay, and I know that I would have a place. That's a friend. And Jesus wants us to have that kind of relationship where we, we continue to knock, not because he doesn't hear or he doesn't want to help us, but he wants us to understand that we don't lose heart even when things don't go our way. I mentioned my father. I remember my mother praying for my dad to get saved. Every time we went to church, and I was just a young boy and I didn't understand much about it then, but every time we went to church, I remember when they asked for prayer requests, she always said, please pray for my husband. He's lost. Every time. I remember many times her praying for him. And then he was, he was a pretty rough character. Dad was an alcoholic. He, he managed to function, but he also was a bootlegger and a lot of other things, gambler, and a bit of a carouser. And I'll be honest with you, I never, I never thought I'd see the day. But I went to a revival, uh, to help in a revival when I was about 19 years old with uh, an evangelist. And we were up in, uh, outside of Columbus, Ohio doing a revival. And I got a phone call, and it was my mom. And she said, your dad wants to talk to you. And uh, she, so dad I, I picks up the phone and said, son, I didn't know what it was. He said, I want you to know I got saved tonight. I'm getting baptized tomorrow, and I'd love for you to come and help baptize me. And what a wonderful day. What a wonderful day to be able to walk down to this, what we call the watery grave, and baptize my own dad. And what a change. God made in his life. I remember at the time I was still living at home and, and many times it come in uh, at, at night and, and he would say, come in and let's have prayer. Let's, let's pray before we go to bed. And he would ask me to pray every night. Got to come and hear me preach. But my mom was one of those who never gave up. Years, years, I'm saying years, she continued to pray for my dad. And that's the kind a persistence that Christ is talking about today. When the Lord comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Yes. Yes, he will. He'll still find people down on their knees. Still find people praying. How long, O oh Lord? We don't know. But we'll continue to pray, come, Lord Jesus. Come. We're going to sing that song in a little bit, Kumbaya, come by here. Lord, we want you to come to this place and visit us today. And so, I encourage you today, keep on keeping on. Keep that relationship going. And if you've drifted away a little bit, try to find a place back because I see it all the time. Lives are destroyed, but it's all because we've not kept up our part of the bargain with God. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. Let's pray. Father, today it's
it's true that we do get discouraged, that we do get frustrated. And we see all the injustice things that happen in the world and even the things that have happened to us, and we want to cry out, why me? Why now? God help us to leave the wise up to you and help us to do our part in this, Lord, in our relationship to you, in our relationship to others, in our work, in our community, and in the world that we keep on keeping on, that we keep knocking. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.